And continuing in thanking our sponsors, we want to thank High Wire Press as well as Access Innovations and SPI Global for their sponsorship. Next we have, and the title is, Dismantling the Stumbling Box that Impede the Researcher's Access to E-Resources. Mr. Roger Schoenfeld, Director of Library and Scholarly Communication Program at Ithaca. Thank you, Darrell. Thank, thank you to the STM Association for having me here today. I'm, I'm really thrilled to be able to share with you some of the, the work and thinking that I've been doing on access and discovery issues for scholarly content. Um, what I'm going to be talking about here today is also evidence-driven uh, in the same way that, in a similar way to that which Michael's talk was, but it will be entirely anecdotal rather than uh, statistical. So I hope you'll bear with me as I change around our methodology just a little bit. I want to give you just a word or two um, of background about myself and my organization for those of you who may not be familiar with Ithaca SNR. Um, we're a not-for-profit research and um, consulting service that's part of the Ithaca organization. Our work falls into two categories. One is educational transformation, which um, in the same ways that the, the talk this morning on um, personalized medicine is really changing the way that healthcare is going to work, so too are there um, substantial changes in the way that education is delivered at an undergraduate level, and, and my colleagues in that program area are focusing on that to, to quite a degree. So for those of you who are interested in that topic, I'd, I'd refer you to some of our work there. I lead our libraries and scholarly communication program, as, as Darrell was saying, and, and, and our role is really to help um, publishers and learned societies and libraries and museums and really the entire enabling infrastructure of scholarship and scholarly communications uh, with, it, with its, its current set of transitions. Um, we do a lot of evidence-based work. Um, we ha I have a, a, a team that includes anthropologists, survey researchers, and, and other professionals who are really gathering up to a very significant degree the user perspective, the researcher perspective, the student perspective on the ways that they use scholarly information, the ways that research practices are changing, teaching methods, learning styles, uh, and so forth. Um, and uh, a lot of our work is made freely available through our website. Um, we also do consultancies as well as projects with individual colleges and universities to help them understand the needs of their own students and, and scholars. Um, so so enough, about, enough about our organization, but just to give you a little bit of the background, um, as I lead into a presentation that's a little bit more anecdotal and a little bit more personal, um, I'm going to be talking about the stumbling blocks that we, as a, as a collective community, put in the way of researchers who um, are trying to access the scholarly materials to which their libraries have um, already provided access, uh, licensed access to them. Um, so this is not a talk really about open access um, at all, just to, just to make sure that that's not, not unclear, though those issues will come up from time to time. Um, and I'm going to be, um, I'm going to be talking um, about a number of, of specific issues that draws from a paper that I, I put out earlier this year um, called Meeting Researchers Where They Start, but I've been continuing to compile some of these stumbling blocks, which I'm going to share with you, uh, some of which I'm going to share with you now. So, um, so, so here, here they are in broad outline form. Um, the library is, is not the starting point um, for academic users. Uh, the campus is not always the work location that they use um, for, their, for their scholarship and, and reading. Um, the proxy, which some of you may know, is the, is the principal way that in the United States, at least, off-campus access is provided to scholarly resources is absolutely not the answer for off-campus needs. The index, by which I mean the discovery index, um, is all too often incomplete. The aggregator, your partners, some of, some of your, your firms yourselves, the aggregations that you produce are not current. Um, the link resolvers that, um, that, that library users rely on are not omniscient. They don't know everything they need to know in order to provide the services that, um, that are needed. Um, and the PC, increasingly, is not the device that any of us will be using to access scholarly literature. So, so, um, so that's not, uh, that's, I'm, I'm, I'm coming at you with a very negative story, but I want, I, I hope you'll see this as an opportunity to really reflect on what the user experience is like and where we can collectively work together to address it. 
Oh, ah, one more, sorry. User accounts. Many of you have user accounts on your, um, uh, uh, on your platforms, and those are really not well implemented, generally speaking. I'm making a lot of generalizations here. There's a lot of good work that's going on in all of these areas as well, but I want you to really focus, I want us today to really focus on where improvements can be, can be made. And, and I want to say a word or two about why you, why the STM community should care um, about these issues. So uh, we know from a lot of our work, you hopefully know from much of your work as well, that research practices have been changing very quickly over the course of the last um, decade or more. Um, your products, the products that your companies um, uh, uh, provide, are used, you may not all realize this all the time, but are generally used inside of the systems environment that the licensing libraries offer. So to the extent that you're not aware of that, that this may be actually one of the biggest takeaways for some, uh, for, for some today in, in this presentation. Um, researchers and students, I've been emphasizing this, face challenges accessing the materials that their libraries license or the open access materials that, that everyone has available to them. Um, and from, from the perspective of publishers, um, traffic is being lost, I believe, to open web sources um, you know, Michael provided some, some data that I think helps us to, to characterize these issues from one perspective. Um, but as, as I'll show, it's not just about open access, about licit open access at all. I think the illicit side of it has a big role to play here as well. Um, and certainly um, open, uh, you know, some of my correspondents have told me, well, open access solves all, the, all these problems. It, it doesn't. But um, it does address several of them effectively, and that's something that we should all bear in mind as we think about the business models and um, access models that we're pursuing. So what I'm going to turn to now, rather than trying to convince you of each of these issues specifically and on a standalone basis, I'm going to share one illustrative case uh, with you for the next 10 minutes or so. And, um, and, and here I'm going to walk through a, a, wor a workflow, a researcher workflow that, that I myself experienced. Um, and and what you'll see here is individual companies and brands and products and journals being singled out. And I want you to, I, I, I want you to understand that it's just for, for the purposes of illustration. I, I in no way mean to suggest that, that these uh, firms or products are any more or less good or bad than anyone else. It just makes for a nice story. So please just bear with the narrative, but recognize that we're all really in this together. So, so here's my um, here's my here's my workflow. I get uh, this is my here I brought it up here. This is my phone. You can see the screen of my phone here. Um, and in the morning, I wake up and I see an alert, a Google Scholar alert that says, "There's a new citation to one of the articles that you've written." This is a this type of alert is is a vanity alert, right? I I'm so excited. Someone cited my work, and you know maybe for the Nobel laureates out there, you know maybe this happens you know five times a day and nobody notices, but you know there's a certain class of researcher where this is a, a big deal, right? Um, I'm cer I'm certainly one of them, <laughs> um, and so so you get you get an alert, and it's um, uh, there's a, a new citation to your article from something called something called technological affordances for the music education researcher. So of course, what do you do? You click on it, and um, and you click on it, and you get to this um, this lovely um, mobile site that is um, it's Sage Journals is the um, is the is the publisher, but the Learned Society is something called Name, which is the um, Association for Music Education, which publishes through Sage. And as you can see, some of you um, laughed already. Um, it's not found. The, the article is not found when you click on it. And so what do you do? You hit the home button to try to figure out, well, what in the world is going on here? And so you get to the home, the home page for this journal. And it's, again, nice mobile optimized site. And you hit search, right? Let's, let's search for it. Something went wrong. Let's go ahead and search for technological affordances for the music education researcher. And you pull up, a, again, a nice, nice search box. And you type in technological affordances for the music education researcher. And, um, and there it is. It's right there. There's the link. So you click on it, right? And it's not found. <laughs> now, now this, please understand, this is, this is a dead end, right? There's no, what do you do? There's nothing else to do. Now, this is, again, not to beat up on anyone. There's a lot of reasons for why this is happening that are not fully in any of these parties' control. But it's obviously not working right, right? So what do you do as the user? Well, 
If you, like me, are a current, have a current affiliation with an academic institution, uh, you might go to your library homepage. Um, here is the Syracuse library homepage. I'm currently a, a student in a master's program at Syracuse University, which is, by the way, an experience that I would commend to all of you to, to see what this is like as a student, um, as a distance learning student, ideally. And, and so here we come to the very nice homepage of the Syracuse University Library with the, um, the Summon search box. Um, Richard mentioned Summon before as the ProQuest tool that's uh, that the discovery service that powers um, uh, uh, some of the Research for Life initiatives. And, um, and Summon searches everything, right? So you type in technological affordances for the music education researcher. Summon pulls it right up. There it is, right? And you click on it, and it takes you to, this is the proxy page. Um, the, the proxy, again, is for those of you who may not be familiar, is the way that, that at, at least in this case, is the way that one authenticates for off-campus access to say that I am, in fact, an affiliate of Syracuse University. And so in those very, very tiny boxes over there, remember, this is on my phone, right? So imagine how small this is. I luckily have my username and password saved. I click uh, authenticate, or whatever that little box says. and. I get to an EBSCO host page where you see it says no results were found. Okay, now, who, wow, dead end, okay? Okay. This is real, by the way. I'm not, like, this actually happened to me one morning, right? Okay, so, so what do you do then? You've hit another second dead end. Now this is, don't forget, someone cited my article. I really, really want to read this article. This isn't just a regular article, right? This is one that I really want to read. So I go back to Summon, right? And you'll see this, this I don't even know if you can see them on the screen there, these little um, symbols, and if you kind of hit them in the right way, it pulls up this little kind of sidebar, okay? And the sidebar, um, look, goes, you, go, you go down and you see there's a, there's a DOI, right? It, it, you know, Ed, wherever you are, you know, this is so exciting, right? This is the canonical way to access the article, right? So I, I know that. I don't know how many scholars do, but I know that. And so I get really excited, and so I click the DOI. And we're right back to not found. Now, this time it doesn't actually have a little home button to click on, right? <laughs> Dead end, right? Okay, so I hope, I hope this is clear that something is really not working here, right? So then what do I do? Well, I'm thinking, these phones, you know, who knows? It's all smoke and mirrors what goes on in them. Let's, let's go to the PC, right? So I pull up the same email account, and I pull up the same, uh, the same email that, that, that was the scholar alert from Google. And I click on it, and it takes me right to the article on the Sage platform. That's pretty cool, I've never gotten there before, right? So something about mobile versus desktop seems to be messing with me, right? And so, and so you see there's, it's a little confusing, but if, if you know the way that this particular platform provider's sort of um, architecture works, you know that there's a little thing over there that's gonna say full text, that that's really the button you wanna click when you get to this page. Almost nothing else on this page matters very much. That, as the user, that's really the button that you wanna click. And, and that takes you to this, to this page, which says, this item requires a subscription, right? And rightly so. And so you see, you know, one thing says sign in if you're already an individual subscriber. Well, I have never heard of this journal before, so I'm not, I'm not a subscriber. So now I'm going to zoom out to show you the rest of what's on this page. You can see, well, I don't know if you can see, but, you know, after sign in for the individual subscriber and after purchase the short-term access and after open Athens users, whatever that may be, um, then you finally get to log in via your institution. And that's exciting to me because that's what I want to do, right? I've already tried to do that three or four times. So I, I click log in via your institution, um, and that takes me into this actually very nice page, sign in via your institution. There's a, a pull-down bar for, for location. So I'm located in the United States, so I, I see United States in common, whatever in common may mean, and I click on United States, and then that takes me down to select your institution, and if you were to believe this interface, you might think there were only six universities in the entire United States that subscribe to this journal. 
And, um, and I don't know, maybe there only are, but, but, but actually I know there are, are quite a bit more from other work that I've done. So this is, you'll, you'll notice if you're at Dartmouth College or Elon University or Stanford or Princeton, you're a winner here, right? This presumably is gonna work for you, and you, you are a winner, really. But, um, but, in fact, but in fact, I'm not. And so for me, this is a dead end, okay? So what do I do? I try again to do the same thing that I tried to do through my uh, phone, and now I'm trying to do it uh, on my PC. And I go back to the library homepage, and here's some, and it looks very different. It's now sort of more, lots more links to click and things to look at. And, and so I type in technological affordances for the music education uh, researcher, and, um, and there it is, just, just like on the mobile device. It pulls it right up on the, um, on the PC, and uh, click on that takes me once again to log in through the, the proxy um, where, um, where once again I, I, I do uh, click authenticate. And it takes me back to EBSCO host where no results were found, which really is another dead end except that I have very good eyes so I have, and very thick glasses and so I, um, so I Notice that on the side there, you wouldn't, you wouldn't, it's not like the part that says no results found shows you to look there, but it says no results found, and so it's also available from try a different source. Now, for the savvy among us, this is what you really want. And there you can see that education source, which is the EBSCO host product, though you wouldn't really understand that from this interface, is not, in fact, what you want. What you really want is Sage Journals Online, even though as a user you really, you know, don't, you've sort of seen the word sage fly past you a couple of times, but you may not even realize that that's what you're looking for. Anyway, you do want to click on Sage Journals Online. And then that takes you back to this page, which was the page you were at, you know, five or six minutes ago in the process, so victory, right? Um, except, for, except for one thing that I want, to, um, I want to make sure to point out. If you look at the browser bar there, I don't know if it probably won't be clear to everyone here, but if you look at the browser bar there, I'm no longer at a sage.com or sagepublications.com uh, uh, URL. I'm at sagepub.com.libeasyproxy2.sir, which is syracuse.edu, which is the, how the proxy is rewriting um, uh, the URL to basically fool, uh, in, in a way that I think everyone is happy with, to fool Sage into thinking that I'm physically on the Syracuse campus. Um, and so I'm back to that, that nice little full text button, which I click on, and there it is. Oh, but, but we're not done yet. We're not done yet. We're not done yet. <laughs> but, but this is victory. We do have the article. But remember, this was a vanity search, right? I might not even want to read the whole article, right? I really want to know what the guys say about me, if anything, right? So I go to, you know, control F to do a find on the site, and I type in my last name, and perhaps you can see it comes up zero out of zero. Did I do this whole thing, and there isn't even a citation to my work here? Well, what you have to remember is that you don't really want this frame, this sort of old-fashioned framed interface, what you really want is the, do you see the yellow show PDF in full window? That's what you really want for the kind of search that I'm doing. So you click on that, and then you do your search for your last name, and then lo and behold, there it is, there's the sentence that mentioned your piece. Now, um, okay, so this is, I, I would like to, I would, I, I, I'm being humorous because, you know, sometimes you, you have to laugh rather than cry. Um, but, but this is not a good user experience. This is not a good researcher experience. And this is, this is, don't forget, this is an article, I already knew what the article was. It's not like I was trying to figure out what article do I want to read. This is what, what, what you might call a known item, uh, 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 effort, you know, effort to access a known item. And, um, and you know, again, I just want I just want to reiterate, I could have swapped any of the brands and companies here with a number of others and produced something that looked almost the same. Um, I've done I've done these now enough times to really try to understand where the weaknesses lie. And what I you know this this was um, you know what was it four dead ends and about m more than twenty clicks from start to finish to get to 
to get to the article that really I only wanted to spend maybe 30 seconds looking at. It took me longer to get to the thing than the amount of time I spent engaging with it. And I think that's really um, unfortunate. So what to do? Um, this is a complex, complex environment. It's a complex environment because as you can see, um, you, you know, the, most of the flaws here were not with any single player, not with the publisher itself, especially not with, you know, it's really the kind of complexity of the environment that is the challenge. So I, I just want to go through all the different individual entities that, that played a role in the experience that I just um, documented for you. So there was a society publisher uh, name, there was a, which is its acronym, strangely enough. Um, there was a publisher partner for it, which of course was Sage. There was a platform provider, which I understand is Highwire in this case. Um, there was an aggregator, which was EBSCO. There was an alerting service, which was Google Scholar. There was a discovery service, which was Summon. There was a link resolver, which you sort of playing a role behind the scenes, which was um, another ProQuest product called Serial Solutions 360 Link. There was a proxy, which is OCLC's easy proxy. Um, there was the Shibboleth authentication system, which um, is provided through the InCommon Federation. Uh, there was the, the way that the libraries configured several of these services, which plays an important role, for example, in the fact that it preferenced EBSCO's host rather than Sage journals. Um, and there was an IT configuration. Um, Syracuse, believe it or not, actually is a Shibboleth uh, uh, member, but for whatever set of reasons, hasn't set it up, or at least at, at this point in time, hadn't yet set it up uh, with um, I guess with Sage is who they would have set it up with. So uh, anyway, all of that is to say that the environment is complex. There are a lot of parties involved, and the solution is there, there's uh, uh, almost every one of these part parties would be needing to do something different than it has done in order to produce a, a, a strong user uh, experience there. So let me just, you know, if sort of stepping back for a few for, for a moment or two, what's really happening here is that the way that we've designed, the way that many publishers and platform providers have designed their systems um, doesn't always bear in mind the complexity of the systems environment that researchers are using their, 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 their content in. And, um, and that environment has gotten more complex in recent years, much more complex. And, and I, I want to call out three of the reasons why, that, why that's happening. One is that so much more usage is happening off campus and, and indeed at a distance through distance education than ever before. Um, and, and you know, this may affect some publishers more than others um, in terms of use cases, but certainly publishers whose materials are used for course adoption purposes at all should really be bearing this, be bearing this in mind. Um, Increasingly, we see users who have multiple institutional affiliations. So that could be someone who is an alumni of one institution, a current student of a second institution, and resides in a public library district that also may provide access to some scholarly content. And that is produ producing an awful lot of confusion at a user account um, and authentication level. Um, and then finally, there is a growing expectation, which I hope many of you feel for your own use of the consumer internet, that we expect our mobile devices to just work seamlessly with, with, with all of the services, the online services and products that we use. So when we're on our PC, we expect that account to work on our PC, and when we're on our phone or our tablet, we expect it all to just carry over and to be almost transparent and, and certainly seamless for us. And, and so to the extent that we're not serving these, these sort of directional um, trends as well as we should be. I think that's, that's something that, um, uh, that, that sh where note should be taken. Now, I want to offer um, four, four final uh, takeaways, trying to shape this up from the perspective of if, if I were a publisher, what are some of the things that, that I would be um, trying, to, tr trying to do here? So, so one um, is, is doing a perhaps more work than many of you are doing at this point to understand the use of your platforms, the use of your content um, in the context of the academic libraries um, and you know corporate institutions too. I, I'm focused on higher education, but, but similar issues I'm, I have to believe obtain in, in other settings as well in the context where your content is actually being used. So um, you know, one of the, there was, there was a, a, a nice, um, uh, an, an interesting initiative that the New York Times took on a little while ago, where it actually turned off access to the New York Times 
um, through its, uh, all the desktop computers in its building, in its headquarters building, so that its reporters, its editors, it, you know, all of its staff had to experience the use of it through a phone. Um, but you know, similarly, experiencing the use, and which produces a very, very different way of understanding what you're writing for, what kinds of ways people are using content, um, and, and moreover, you know, just, just trying to figure out what it's like to have your content used in an academic library context, I think, in the, in the context of that, not physically in the library, but the systems environment that the libraries um, are, are providing, I think, is, is essential. Um, a, second, a second priority is um, if you're not already doing this, you should really consider setting expectations for how quickly your content appears in discovery services that you're partnered with and aggregators that you're partnered with. Now, in some, we're often focused on we want to have an embargo, right? Maybe we want to have an embargo. That's fine, um, you know, if that's the choice that you want to make. But, but the expectations in some cases are that the content appears immediately in these services and in fact, the reality is there are often meaningful delays of days or, or weeks or sometimes longer. And um, certainly as I've stumbled across those delays, it's produced all sorts of headaches. That's you know, perhaps the reason why EBSCO host was failing for me here. Um, it's perhaps the reason, I, I know it's the reason why Project Muse has failed for me on another occasion recently. And, and so whatever those, whatever those timelines are, whatever those expectations are, getting that communicated clearly to the link resolvers and the knowledge bases that, that you're all populating is essential because that allows those links to be made properly to, to wherever uh, the users should be going. Um, the standalone mobile indices and interfaces that I find myself um, all too often experiencing are, are driving me crazy. Um, and I think, I, I, th I think you saw a number of the challenges here where the, uh, uh, as you saw, the mobile phone interface, the MDOT platform was failing, uh, Sage's MDOT platform was failing. Um, I understand perhaps because the index doesn't get updated as quickly for the mobile platform as it does for the, uh, uh, for the desktop platform. There are these kinds of things floating around all over our ecosystem, and there's really no, no reason for that in a, in a modern environment. And then finally, a lot of these off-campus access issues and a number of other issues that, that we're bumping into, that, 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 that many users are bumping into, um, come from the fact that, that, they're, that user accounts are really fragmented. Um, I, I emphasize the challenges associated with user accounts where, um, where, where you have multiple institutional affiliations. But similarly, the, uh, the fact that there's often a, you know, um, a, an account for each, uh, for each platform that a user may have alerts or other kinds of, 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 um, of uh, uh, information or preferences associated with is actually, uh, I, I believe, is, is causing a great deal of confusion for users as well. So thinking about what a user account might look like, maybe it's a shared user account, some kind of single sign-on approach for users. There's a variety of directions that this might take, but thinking seriously about what kinds of user accounts um, should we as a community and you as individual uh, entities be offering and, and how, does the, how can that be used to increase the seamlessness for users, but also the personalization of the services that you can offer researchers and other users, I believe is an important priority as well. So, um, so I hope that's given a, a brief overview of some of the challenges we face, some of the barriers that we're creating, but I hope also some solutions that can be considered, and I, I look forward to any questions or discussion you might have. Thank you. We have a question right here. Roger, it's Anthony Watkinson, Cyber Research. But I've heard Roger before giving an earlier version of this, not so detailed. Um, could you add on to this the problem of downloading and saving? Different, I find that different companies, it's much easier to download and save, and sometimes it completely defeats me. Have you had this similar problem? Uh, cer certainly there are better and worse approaches to sharing and downloading and you know interacting with citation management systems and, and all of these kinds of tools um, so yes I think we could we could add that to the list without without question I, I 
personally think that over time, the best solution would be to think about that in the context of a single user account, how that might be able to, to, to link to some of the article management systems that, are, that, that, that we heard discussed earlier today. Um, but I think that's, that's maybe a few steps ahead. Other questions? Yes. Richard Padley from Semantico. Thank you, Darrell. It's Richard Padley from Semantico. <laughs> uh, Roger, that was, that was great. And um, uh, one thing that, that strikes me is, is, um, is uh, how... No, I'm not going to say that. Um, <laughs> you uh, tell me later. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's th so the question here about you know about mobile is the piece that I wanted to ask you about. Okay, which, which mm -hmm. is which is which is this? You know, one of the things that we see from from our um, from our fr fr from the product platforms that we build is that we 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 the, the the growth in usage is coming almost exclusively from mobile devices. So whereas you know the traffic from desktop devices PCs is is pretty much flat, growth is happening on mobile. Now that seems to speak to me an awful lot to the problems that you're talking about there. A lot of them are surround, uh, centered around this idea that we've kind of bolted on mobile interfaces as a sort of a little bit of an afterthought. Um, you know, can you just talk a little bit more about the mobile specific aspect of that as opposed to the kind of the the, the other parts of the ecosystem? Yeah, ab absolutely. Th thank you, Richard. And, and you know, I, uh, for for those of you who haven't seen it, Richard had a very nice uh, piece in Research Information that touched on some of these issues just just a couple of weeks ago, I guess. Um, I think mobile is. You know, I hear very different things from different providers on mobile. Um, for, from, from some, I hear, oh, you know, I'm not seeing much growth in mobile, I'm not seeing much usage in mobile, and um, so I don't want to invest in it. And, you know, that's, I, I have to say, from, from what I'm seeing broadly, that is exactly the wrong answer right now. Um, one of the, you know, for those of you who, who, who may have that perspective, I would challenge you to ask yourselves, do you have a mobile site that works better than the one that I just showed you. Um, because if you don't, then that's why you're not seeing a lot of traffic. Now, um, now, so, so you know, broadly speaking, um, I think, I think, you know, there's different types of use cases. Certainly, many of us probably don't want to read, you know, a 15 or 20 page PDF on our phone. Um, even, you know, even as phone screens are getting bigger and, uh, you know, screen quality is getting better. Um, but there's a lot of use cases for an article that don't involve reading the whole article. In fact, probably most of them don't really involve reading the whole article. A lot of what a researcher wants to do is to, is to take a quick look at it, decide if it's something worth spending some more time on, and you know, as, as Anthony was suggesting, putting it into a place that you can then access later on to, to reflect on further into a citation management system, into a, into a uh, collaboration network, et cetera. Um, and so I think that, I think that the, you know, there certainly are different kinds of, um, different kinds of, of use cases for, um, for mobile and for desktop. I, d I don't mean to suggest they should be identical to one another, but I think the key point, at least from my perspective, is that, is that they should be more seamless and they should work together rather than against one another. Any other questions? Well, yes, there's one. Yes, Barbara, you'll give her the mic. Wonderful. Thanks, Roger, that was absolutely brilliant. Um, I'm Alicia from Elsevier, by the way. And um, so how would you convene groups to solve those problems that you just illustrated so geniusly? It would involve <laughs> libraries and publishers and aggregators and other intermediaries. Are you gonna bring us together or are we gonna just organically do it? What's needed <laughs> to address it? Well, I mean, so, so I think that's a really good question. So a lot of my work has over time, as, as you know, has been focused more on the library community. And, and actually, one of, the, um, one of the challenges here as you really dig into some of the pain points is how little influence libraries have had um, at, at a lot of these handoff points. Mo most of them are really in the kind of publisher, platform provider, and all of these various intermediary systems that libraries typically, but not always, license from someone else. So, so you know, I, I have wondered, should my advice be, libraries, you should write stronger contracts with your publishers and vendors and, you know, write in all of the details of exactly what you need. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not prepared to say that, certainly. Um, I, I actually think a, a good deal of what's needed here is 
for the publisher community and this sort of vendor intermediary community, uh, discovery service, ven uh, uh, library systems, link resolver, et cetera, community, which really sells and has, a, I think, its closest relationships with libraries rather than with publishers. I think what's really needed there is for a, more of a common, um, gra you know, uh, uh, common is the wrong word, a kind of a conversation in that, in that space. Um, maybe there's a role for my organization to convene some of that. I haven't really, um, I haven't really thought about that, but I would be interested in your thoughts and, and those of others here today as well about what, what steps forward we might take. I, I certainly suggested some specific things that publishers individually can take on, but some of these are really, uh, for example, the issue about a single user account is really something that requires bringing together an entire community, and I'm, I'm not sure I know exactly how best to do that at this point. Yes, Mr. Richard Wynn from Aries has a question. Oh, excuse me. Thanks, uh, Richard Wynn from Aries. Um, you, you just said the, the phrase, a single user account, and, I, and I'm wondering really why we're not taking Laurie up on what she said this morning about ORCID being a way to tie people to institutions. And it seems like the, the solution is staring us in the face here, and I'm, I'm wondering why that's not part of uh, the the dialogue. It's a it's a it's a great question. Um, I've so so I've been posting on some of these issues and, and others related to them on the scholarly kitchen over the course of this year, and I've um, that's a question that comes up again and again. Why isn't Orchid the solution to this? And I would I, I I'm not um, I I would love to see Orchid as as either the solution or or a part of a solution. Um, I think that what I think that what um, what we ultimately um, need to see is something that goes well beyond uh, researchers and research contributors, though, because don't forget that we're talking about students and um, other kinds of users as well. Now, that, that might be something that could be accomplished inside of that, inside of that framework. But ultimately, I think um, it's in, if, if there were a way to attach um, institutional um, uh, permissions or um, uh, access rights into a, an ORCID-like authentication system, then that might indeed be a solution to this set of, uh, one set of issues here, absolutely. Yeah, I'm David Thomas with Thomson Reuters. <clears throat> the question is, is all of what you're just describing, do you see the, the reliance of the student, the modern student researcher today on the library lessening and lessening? Do they see the library as an obstacle or do they see the library as part of the solution? That's a good question. I, I don't know if I can answer that dispositively. Um, certainly in our surveys of, of faculty members in the US, of academics in the UK, um, and, and, and researchers in other, other countries as well, um, the, the library is, is widely recognized and, and, and valued for its role in, in buying, in paying for, in licensing scholarly content. So um, I, I, I don't know if that specifically speaks to the question you're asking, but I think, the, I think many um, academic users certainly understand the role that the library is playing. Now, now I, I, you know, of course there are, um, you know, I've, I've heard the, this question before, is that, is that role sustaining itself, is it changing? Um, but, but everything that I've done, all the work that I've done so far really shows the, the value that researchers place in that, in that role of the library. All right, I'll just say something really quick. So to your point, Richard, and to your point, Roger, um, ORCID is working with identity providers. So um, as a service provider, so exactly what you said, ORCID becoming an attribute that's exchanged during that logging on process, being able to authenticate into a university system, but ORCID also potentially as a way to address communication across identity federations and also to deal with the um, the unaffiliated researcher or student issue. So these are conversations we're having, and Alicia, to your question about um, how to bring people together, this is a broader question clearly than just ORCID, and we're working very broadly across the community, um, and I think could, you know, certainly anyone who's in, interested in getting involved um, can talk to either myself or Josh about how to dial into some of the meetings that are going on right now. That's great, thank you. Hanford von Hindenburg with Elsevier. I'm going to join the chorus of those that are congratulating you on that presentation. Unfortunately for us publishers, this is too good a story or really too bad a story. Um, but my question is whether this kind of user experience, it ties in with the 
previous questions, uh, question just here, whether this type of user experience drives people, in your view, to uh, scholarly sharing networks such as ResearchGate, not because they don't, not because they don't, they have to go there, because they are in the library system, they could just get get access in theory uh, through that. But because it is so complicated, you might as well go to ResearchGate. There, it's easy. Chances are the articles there as well. Is that a route that people take? Thank you for asking that question. Um, I think that is is uh, you know in in one sense that's the elephant in the room of this story. Um, what you actually would never do, what I would never do if I weren't personally interested in these questions, is go through four dead ends and twenty plus clicks to get to one of these articles. Right? There are alternatives that are are much better, really, than the systems environment that I showed you. So you know what can't be found on Google can possibly be found on ResearchGate and, or, or other you know other such services. And I think there you know I think I, I wouldn't you know and and there there's both the um, as Michael distinguished a few minutes ago the sort of licit sharing, um, but also the illicit sharing, which I'll remind you from a user perspective, as long as you can discover the article, from a reader perspective, as long as you can discover the article, licit and illicit is, is, a, is irrelevant, right? You just want to, to read the thing, get the thing. So I, um, so I think you're asking exactly the right question, and that certainly is um, it, you know, I, do, I don't want to kind of put that up as a, as a scary thing or a bad thing, or I, I, but I think the rea it, you know, re realistically, um, the, there are a lot of open web or um, you know, non-publisher sources for a lot of this content, and, um, and certainly uh, the barriers that we've thrown up, the stumbling blocks that we collectively have thrown up, um, I think uh, are really driving a lot of usage in those directions. Um, Um, hi, Heather Staines from ProQuest Zipex, and I just wanted to kind of point back to Alicia's question. Um, I was in the NISO single sign-on working group Espresso, which is one of the, the lesser known NISO uh, recommended practices, <laughs> but we just dealt with the single sign-on sign -on portion of this, and we went around and we talked about it, and we had, you know, dead-end examples, and how confusing is this? And we had, you know, we had the libraries there, we had the publishers there, we had um, we had aggregators there, but the piece that we were missing from our perspective was the federations. Um, and when you talk about the campus side of things, it's more than just the library. It's, it's the IT and it's some of the other things that were you know, on the slide as players. So this is very complicated. Not that it shouldn't be addressed, but we really banged our head against the wall for, for two years just on the single sign-on piece and, and wonder you know, how much we accomplished there. But I'd be happy to, to get involved if somebody wants to put a group together and try to tackle this. So. My my own view is that um, what we're you know if so so we heard a little bit about about Orchid and I I want to learn more about you know Orchid's potential role here I I'm, I'm I I don't feel like I fully understand the potential there, um, but but my view is that the issue here is not so much creating a standard um, as it is finding a trusted party to serve as the center of of this of such a service and I think that that's probably the harder the harder h harder than setting a standard in a lot of ways so um, but I'm I'm optimistic so we'll we'll press forward let's give Roger a big round of applause Thank you.